Hello and welcome back to the Toolbox series. In this video, we're gonna get the box cleaned up and then slice that lid off. Let's get going. So slicing the lid off, I would say this is on par with gluing the box together in terms of being terrifying. It's a pretty nerve wracking task. And so as always, we wanna make sure we've got the best possible chance of it being successful. There is a few ways of doing this using different machines, different hand tools. For example, we're going to be doing this with a plunge router. We're gonna run a six millimeter groove up that top tail and then slice off the remainder using a hand saw. You could also create that groove with a plow plane. I've also seen it done on a table saw, but you've got to be really careful with that one. And you can also do it on a spindle molder using a slotting head cutting in from the side like this. All of those methods work great, but to keep with the routing theme of this series, we're going to be doing it with the plunge router and then finishing off the remainder with the hand saw. And so I'll talk you through that process. And so in order for any of the above processes to work, whether we're going to be buzzing the machine over this or whether we're going to be putting this over a machine, we need to ensure that the sides are flat and they're not rocking, twisted, you know, just making sure that we've got a nice accurate foundation to work from. So to begin with, that is going to involve flushing these off. This is always a bit of a tricky one to clamp, but whatever method you use, make sure you're clamping it around the sort of joint area. Don't clamp it in the middle of the box. Because of the way we've done the floating bottom and the floating panels, there's a chance you can actually bow that in and therefore flushing these joints isn't going to be very accurate. So just make sure you've got a lot of support around the clamping area. And what's interesting with these joints at the moment is although we set the marking gauge to be the exact thickness of the components, therefore not having any end grain sit proud when they assembled, the way that these blocks push exactly on the areas that it needs to be pushed has actually meant that these have sunk slightly below the baseline, which is great because we can now use that end grain to our advantage to close up some gaps. So firstly, I'll just get the plain cutting. I've got a very light camber on this, freshly sharpened. So I've just got to a tail here and there's a small gap that I don't like the look of. And my last resort for fixing something like this is dust and glue. Reason being the dust, it never quite matches the color of the timber and you end up with this weird sort of line next to all the joints and it's actually quite obvious that there's some sort of filler there. What I prefer to do, especially with oak, is actually mushroom this end grain out to fill that gap. And the way I do it is this. You get some sort of metal rod thing, a nail punch works quite well for this, and you put that on the end grain while tapping it above with a metal hammer. This will start spreading out those fibers and actually aid in filling that gap. You, of course, just have to be careful that you don't go too far with it and cause dents below that surface. So then I use the hammer just to try and blend it in a bit. Flush it off. There we go. <laughs> I love that trick. Now, don't get me wrong, that trick won't always do wonders. Occasionally, you end up with little gaps like this still, and it's only when gaps are that small that I will go for the dust and glue trick, because it will literally only take a few grains of dust or whatever you want to call it to fill that gap, and so it will never be noticed. But you really don't want to be filling gaps that are more than half a millimeter big. It's just far too obvious. Planing it flat is pretty standard practice. Get all the end grain down to sit flush with the surface behind it. Only at that point will we start moving on to sanding things. You may recall in previous series, I said never to flush off joints using sandpaper. This is especially one of those cases. Do it with a plane. The reason I'm honing in here is because you may see on the end of this mitre, there's a little bit of end grain. The reason that is there is because I've planed too much on this surface and actually made that mitre uneven, which is somewhat understandable because I haven't flushed off this surface yet, but just keep an eye on that. If you can see any end grain on a mitre, it means it's not meeting the corner perfectly. We need to flush it down on this face a little bit more in order to bring that down enough to look like a good mitre. There we go, there's that same corner brought down to the mitre. Okay, so that's all the sides flushed off. They're not looking particularly pretty, but we'll sort that out in a minute. The next thing we need to sort out is the top and bottom, making sure that all these mitres are flush up there and down there.
Okay, so now that everything's flushed off with the plane, there is two ways we can proceed with this. The first one is going to be to cut the lid off now. The second one is to sand it before cutting off the lid. And there's arguments for doing both. If we sand now and get it all up to a pristine finish, by the time we cut the lid off and we've run the router over it and we've sawn it and stuff, we're gonna start knackering that sanded surface on the outside. However, on the other hand, if we cut the lid off now and then leave the sanding to after they've been separated, there's a chance we might overdo it or underdo it on the lid or the main carcass, thus meaning they're not going to be the same size. And so what I would recommend doing is sanding to 120 grit. Whether you start at 120 or whether you start at 80 doesn't really matter, but just sand it up to that grit that basically gets rid of all the tear out, all the sort of fluffy edges that have been left over from the planing and just generally get the thing to a consistent finish. And we'll do that on the top, we'll do that on the sides, we'll do it on the bottom. We might as well do everything up to 120 grit and that way, after we separate the lid, we've then just got to do a final bit of sanding with 180, which will get rid of the sort of burnishing left over from the router and any other minor surface imperfections that would have been transferred to the piece throughout that process. So when I was planing it, this oak actually turned out to be quite challenging to plane. You can see there's little bits of tear out there. There's a little bit of tear out there. And there's also that knife line that I've tried planing out as much as I can from when I scribed the length on the wrong end of the component right at the beginning of this series. And so I might as well try and sand that out now, better than doing it after it's been separated. So for that reason, I'm purposely going to start with 80 and then finish up with the 120. Okay, so that is all the sanding complete. It's about 90% of the way there. We'll do the rest of it after slicing off the lid. And so to do this, we are going to be using a router, a plunge router more specifically, and it's got a six millimeter bit in it. And the diameter of that bit is dictated by how much larger that top tail is, which in this case is also six millimeters. And the reason we're putting a channel in it first, whether you're using a router, a spindle molder, a table saw, a plow plane, whatever, the reason we're doing that is to give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room with the handsaw when we finish it off, because we're not gonna go all the way through with the router in this case, and I'll explain why in a bit. But doing this with a saw, there is obviously a chance for it to track the grain or for you to get a little bit of wobble or something like that, and therefore cut too far into the lid or too far into this. Whereas having a six millimeter channel gives us three millimeters of tolerance either way, so it's worth doing. So I'm going to begin by giving myself a lovely clear mark in the middle of that large tail. And we're gonna strap the fence to the router, plunge the bit down so it's just shy of the top surface. You don't want it touching or else it's gonna put loads of scratches in it while we get it in the right position. And we just gotta move it until that cutter is sitting exactly over the middle of that line. Now at the moment it's getting a little bit wobbly on this corner here. And so that's where you may want to consider putting some sort of sub base on the router. In this case, I've got this, which acts as a nice reducer. But yeah, in the past, I've made an MDF base that I've bolted to the bottom of these, drilled a very small hole in the middle, just enough to fit the cutter through. And that's been a really nice support around the cut. So as you can see, that's nice and centralized now. So then just really wrench down those locks for the fence to ensure that doesn't move because we've got quite a bit to do with this. And next, we need to sort out the depth. Now, when setting the depth for this, it's very important we don't cut all the way through, because if you do, you'll get to that fourth side, the lid will separate, the router will catch on it, and you're gonna get a big chunk taken out, you'll probably get a bit of kickback, it won't be very nice. So what I do with the router is I cut about three millimeters shy of the inside face. So all of this will turn to dust, and we'll leave just a little bit there on all four sides to then separate with a saw later. So I may as well use that line I've just drawn. We're gonna bring it down to that line, lock it in position, and then drop the depth stop down to the lowest turret and then lock it back in position. So now when I plunge this down and this depth stop hits that bottom stop, I know that it's cutting about three millimeters shy of the back face. What's more, we can actually use these two remaining turrets to step that cut down as we go. So I've still got to attach a dust extractor to this, but run it along there and check you're happy with that motion and keeping the fence pushed into the side. You have got to be careful on the back edges that you don't tilt them off like that. Likewise on the front edge like this as well. Just make sure to keep the fence pushed into the side of the box. So I'll probably start like this, get to the middle, move my pressure to the side like that. And then as I get off the end, move it back here so that I'm still pushing on the toolbox and I'm not pushing anything over the edge like that. So I'm all ready to go. The other thing I forgot to mention is I've also oriented the fence to be on the right-hand side of the component. 
This is important because as that cutter is spinning, it's going to be trying to push the machine one way or the other. And if you've got the fence on the right hand side, that cutter is going to actually be pulling the fence in tighter against this side of the box. Rather than resting the fence on the left hand side, when you push this forward, it's actually going to try and drift it away from the side of the box, therefore giving you a wobbly cut. So that's a nice little thing. In addition to the side support I've got going on here, the cutter's also going to be doing it as well. So we'll set it up to that first turret and go for it. So I'm going to plunge it first, make sure it's clear of the side of the box, lock it down, double check it's still clear of the box, get my hand into position. So that's the first pass done, nice and controlled, looking good. Spin the turret to that next position. Well, I just broke my route a bit. That's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to have to replace that cutter. So unplug it first. And I'm going to try and replace it without moving the fence. So ideally, I want to keep that locked in exactly the same position. Does, of course, mean I'm going to have to reset the depth, but that's a minor problem. All right, that's looking good. So we're just gonna slowly work our way around one side at a time. Obviously just be careful on these ends because they're quite an awkward position. And this is why we're not doing it on the router table, by the way. You can, but I find that trying to pass something this tall over a cutter right down at the bottom is quite a bit tippy. I don't really like it. Okay, so apart from breaking a cutter, that went very well. Saying that, however, the second cutter I used was a round nose cutter rather than just a normal straight square ended cutter. The second one, I haven't used one before for this purpose, so much better. It felt better entering the cut, it felt better throughout the cut, and it felt better exiting the cut. And not only that, but the fact we've now got a U-shaped cut in here as opposed to a straight one, it means that our saw is going to be encouraged to stay at the bottom of that U-shape, therefore being bang on in the middle of this groove, which is great. So. I definitely recommend getting a round nose cutter for this. It's brilliant. There's a lesson in every mishap. I guess that's not a saying, but there it is now. So now all we've got to do is finish off that cut. And I prefer using a Japanese saw for this. Ideally, you want one without a spine on it so you can go into the toolbox and not be restricted by this. Unfortunately, this is all I've got, but we can use that sort of front third in order to do this cut. So right in the middle. Of course, on these corners, just check what's happening on the back there as well. I don't know why, but every time I make this project and I'm separating the lid, I'm fully aware that the inside is pre-finished, but as soon as that lid separates and I look at the inside, it's like, it's finished. <laughs> it's, I, I, I don't know why I have that thought, but I, I guess it's because I haven't seen them more into, I, I digress. Right, we're gonna start flushing down the lip around the outside using a plane and then call this step done. So we've obviously got this lip to remove and there will always be some small amount of wobble from the router that means you need to clean up the bottom surface as well. That'll happen no matter what method you use. There might also be small steps on the corner here. We'll get the plane finally set and start flushing it off. One thing to note however, when you're coming in from these corners, make sure to skew your plane like I'm doing here. Don't go in straight like that or else you might catch this inside wall and it will break off. And that's not what you want on your pre-finished inside. So quite a heavy skew. You can then straighten it up as you go through the cut and then perhaps just skew it again as you go off the opposite end just to be sure and so once you've got rid of the majority of the lip and you're just doing the final bit of flushing go back and resharpen your plane because what you're wanting to do here is start on a corner remember to skew it go all the way through and then make that turn 
to go to the opposite corner. And if you can manage it, even turn back to come back towards you. This will give you the best possible chance at getting this surface flat. It's also gonna take a bit of trial and error. I've got to do quite a lot corner to corner first, but I'm basically looking for a full width shaving across each of these sides to tell me that each of them is flat. And also don't forget to check that they're square as well when you're doing it. And then as you go in, keep checking the fit on the toolbox itself and obviously make sure you're putting it round the same way each time you do it. Ideally you would label it somehow, but I've got some quite wacky grain on the side here that's a bit of a giveaway. But that is sitting on there pretty good. It never normally goes that smoothly, I must say. Now if you do put it on there and you find that it is somewhat rocking corner to corner but you don't know if it's the carcass or if it's the lid that's out of whack, that's where you're going to need to get a set of winding sticks to diagnose the twist. You'll want to pop those on the top of the toolbox, preferably along those edges. Firstly make sure they're not rocking on a bump in the middle because that'll be your first problem and then after you've established that spin it round and sight along them to see if they're in line with each other. And do that for both the carcass and the lid independently. But I cannot emphasize enough, make sure that they are actually sitting flat on these edges first. Because if they're rocking on a bump on here, then you're gonna be getting an inaccurate reading no matter what. Now I hesitate to say it's all plain sailing from here, but that part we've just done is by far the most nerve wracking part of the entire project. Maybe apart from gluing the thing together, of course. But from here, all we've got to do is start adding the hardware, which includes the hinges and the lock, should you wish to add one and um, start fitting out the internals. And so, of course, well done if you've got this far. And with that, thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do not forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next lesson.